Marconi's first ever year-round bourbon was an inspiration. It all had to work together. A blend of carefully selected ingredients, Texas-sized pot stills, and creative people determined to find the absolute best way to usher a new whiskey along. When you discover how it pairs with a meaningful moment, suddenly the feeling of drinking great whiskey becomes a whole lot more. Hey everybody, welcome to this week's episode of Whiskey Neat, Spirited Conversations with Interesting People. I am your host, Christopher Hart, and yes, look at this studio. It's not even done. We've got a lot we plan to do with this. Things are going good. We we plan to do so much. I mean, listen, 2020 has not been great to anybody, but I plan to end this year on a nice note. And that includes today's episode. So today we cover the great first ever annual inaugural Pappy Hunt that's taken place in Houston, where we have buried and hidden up to six bottles, more than $3,000 in whiskey to give away for free for those who will simply get off your couch, get out of your house and, and go looking. So. Uh, three bottles have been found. There were three bottles left. We've got an E.H. Taylor single barrel, a um, Van Winkle Lot B, and the Pappy 15. Now, those three winners who have already found the three previous bottles have just met me before we recorded this today and claimed their own individual clue. So they've got a leg up on you. I will continue to put them out here put the clues out on the show. There's some definite clues in this episode at several points. I encourage you to find the clue via YouTube. The audio is great, don't get me wrong, but it may be hard to hear a clue indicator, the pap the, the Whiskey Pete logo that's gonna be in the video portion of the episode. So be on the lookout for that. Uh, Whiskey Neat is supported by the Inspired Spirits at Glass Rev Imports and Amroot Distilleries. Amroot crafts one of the most award-winning Indian single malts to the exact same standards as Scotch. Amroot Fusion also received the double gold blind and scored a jaw-dropping 96 points by judges at the Proof Awards. Amroot Single Malt Whiskey is widely available across America and can be found almost everywhere in the great state of Texas. Go out and get a bottle today. Now, for those of us not in Texas, Amroot is available in your state. I am sure of it. So please go looking for it. Let me know what you think. I try not to rec recommend anything that I don't love, and I love me some Amroot. Um, our private barrel will be available statewide within a couple of months. I hope it, hope it comes in on the October shipment, so very soon, just a few weeks. And uh, yeah, these two here, these two Balcones single barrels, for those of you who can see them on camera, we just picked two barrels of, of Balcony single malt cast strength. For those of you who love the Sam Hewen episode and often ask me, what did I serve Sam Hewen in that episode? And I will tell you, it was cast strength single barrel Balcones. And these are two different cast strength single barrel single malt Balcones. Uh, they're ex rumble cask, which means uh, they previously held and aged some ex rumble, which is another great, beautiful spirit from from them. We tasted Martin Riza on the Rumble Cask Reserve and Coleman Domingo on the Rumble Cask Reserve in the last two weeks episodes. Uh, shout out to Anthony Starr from, from the boys. Uh, great episode, great discussion. Couldn't have been happier to meet the guy and I cannot wait to see what comes out of that man for the next few years. He's going to be a huge star. Um, without going too much further, rambling the entire time, I just want to say thanks. Thanks for those participating in the contest. Thanks for, for Balcones for sponsoring and believing in the show. Thank you to Amroot for being just amazing and supporting us for over a year now. Thanks for the new studio. Thanks for everything. I, I really can't wait to see what comes f from the show in the next 12 months. And I just really appreciate you all. Without further ado, I sit down with Jace Van Hooser and Todrick Groob, uh, both now multiple guests' appearances on the show. We talk about the Pappy Hunt. We talk about Reserve 101. We talk about some upcoming barrel selections we did with HBS. I'm just 
feeling good. So, without further ado, Jace Van Hooser, Todrick R. Grub. Cheers. So I did bring a few things. Let me turn my, thing, my phone off here. I brought, I thought we could try a couple things. So we did a couple of new barrel picks with Balconies, both ex-Rumble cask. We're about to head back there in two weeks to do some rum picks, some rumble picks, and anything else we taste that we love. Uh, Todrick is joining me. Uh, and then I also brought some Dusties and of course this thing. So for those who are watching at home, the guy, the genius behind Whistlepig, Raj, and I believe it's Bakta, could be pronouncing that wrong, I apologize. But he decided to, to venture out into cognac and, and Armagnac and brandy. So brandy, for those who don't know, is, is just, it's basically fruit whiskey, Dist distilled fruit. Uh, cognac and Armagnac are just specific kinds of brandy. So you can't bring this stuff over to the US from Cognac or Armagnac and still call it that. You have to just call it brandy. He got his hands on some old casks. The youngest one in this bottle is 50 years old, and it's got a cask in it of several vintages going all the way back to 150 years ago, the oldest barrel being from 1868. It's then crazy. he, f it's the, Legitimately, to his credit, it is arguably probably the oldest thing in the bottle currently in the world. Mm -hmm. 150 years old. I don't know of anything wow. in the bottle. And that. So just from the historical aspect, it's a very fascinating concept. And price-wise, it's relatively cheap, $300. So $300 plus shipping, and you get it all over here. So I think I paid $330. For what you're getting from the historical aspect and the love of time capsules like these things, it's worth the money regardless of what it tastes like. Now, that being <laughs> that, said. That's what I was gonna say. Why, why is it priced the way that it's that priced? That being said, uh, generally speaking, I think as Americans, we get obsessed with numbers. We think, oh, 150 years old, it must be worth everything and it must be amazing. No, arguably anything that old, uh, a lot of the older Lin Cantata picks we've had tastes like a dead tree. Mm -hmm. It's interesting, but it's it's not arguably Some of the good. old rums that we tried as yeah. well. Oh yeah, we just recently interesting, not good. <laughs> we recently we we recently in Moore is a dead distillery and Iflut is a dead distillery out of Gu uh, Guyana. We tasted through some twenty seven year old and thirty year old single barrels, and they were garbage. Yeah, and so so garbage that we weren't going to buy them because even if we bought them and took the slightest bit of cut off the top for gregarious, it would still be three four hundred five hundred mm -hmm. bucks yeah. for something that tastes like old laundry. Yeah, like yeah. A old laundry is a good yeah. word. Yeah. <laughs> so let's try it here. So I will say this: I love the box. I hate the bottle. This is a very Art Deco esque wannabe bottle. I don't. I think you could have put a little bit more. It's growing on me in person. Actually, it feels old to me. Like it feels like something that was sitting on the shelf in like nineteen fifty. Okay, I'm gonna set my mic down to open this. By the way, guys, check out the new set. Hey. It's it's great, right? I love it so much. Thank you, uh, Brandon uh, from Culture Map. Thank you. ESPN. Uh, we're, we plan to do a lot more with it, especially getting some boom mics because I think we've outgrown the <laughs> handheld mics. But I'm going to set this down and uh, we can taste it and then we can jump into our Balcones picks. I, I, I have to say that brandy is something I'm not all too familiar with, so this will be interesting. Brandy and cognacs, truthfully, all together. There was, I was never in a spot in my bartending career where they were paramount. There's a lot of interesting stuff out there. Like a Copper and Kings is doing a very a lot of very whiskey like brandies that I would I would recommend. I, it smells I good. I don't know if this is going to be a good example. Or not. Well, and I'd like to talk about our Happy Van Winkle scavenger hunt. I just sniff, I just sniffed the microphone. See, I'm going to get confused. Here. Yeah, I did the same thing too. I poured it. Up? I poured it and <laughs> brought my mic to my nose to smell the mic. I'm like, Why do I smell the mic? <laughs> it smells great. It smells great. It really they, does. They, they used Isla casks. Uh, peated Isla whiskey cask to kind of finish the brandy, which I think is clear to try to brighten up the flavor a little bit. Hmm. It's interesting, very medicinal. Uh, it has, I mean, very much like iodine band aid, which is very. Yeah, the peat comes through. Yeah, very yeah. indicative of Isla. I'm a huge peat head. I just I my opinion on this is because the barrels are so old, they, it it probably needed some brightening up. Yeah, so but, but why peat? Because it already has that mustiness to it, and I, you know I'm not sure how well that I, I don't dislike it. I just, yeah, it's not I, horrible. I just wonder if a different finish but would the, have been better. What I said online was that the peat casks clearly overpower everything that's going on. Yeah, 
and and that's okay. It's still worth three hundred bucks. I don't think this over. Well, it's there. It doesn't overpower the sweetness of the brandy. I kind of like it. I got the peat immediately, and it kind of stayed with me as I found the different the different oh, yeah. notes, you know. But like usually, like like an Ardbeg or the or something with just a peat bomb. Usually, after a couple seconds, it dissipates, and you, I can kind of match oh. some of this out. This is just a very steady. It's a oh, it's it's way. a peat bomb for sure. I mean, it's very much. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if there was a little bit of, uh, which is tricky, and and I'm not accusing them of this, but it's very common to skirt the rules a little bit and barrel finishing by by using a wet barrel. Right. Um, I've talked about this before, but there's a very famous or infamous Texas distiller that's no longer distilling whiskey that has played around with, with uh, finishing in some cognac barrels that had some very clear amounts of cognac in the barrel mm -hmm. still. Um, this won't, I wouldn't be surprised if there was still Ardbeg or something yeah. in the barrel when they yeah. added these to it because it's very pronounced. It's mm. not bad. No, it's very interesting. <clears throat> it's a, like I said, it's a time capsule. So let's yeah. talk about this Pappy Hunt while we drink our brandy. Here. Yes, let's. Uh, I guess how, I should have slowed down. How, yeah. Oh, did you already <laughs> finish it? We'll pour something else. So um, Todd brought the okra pick. Uh, so well, actually, did I bring this out? Why did I bring this out? I also brought the whistle pig and Sagamore. I don't know where you want to put them in the lineup here, but if you guys want to try well, that. Well, let's, let's do the whistle pig first. Okay. So um, for those who don't know, we've been doing quite a bit with Reserve 101 lately, and you guys uh, have been very supportive. It's given us something to do. Yeah. <laughs> we got a team together to pick, and I got the age statement back on this barrel. It's a 15-year-old whistle pig. So Please. you guys, yeah, just grab... Yep throw some in there this was picked by a new crew right some new and old or, or um erica was there uh everyone else was new to picks i believe with hbs okay when we had three people who had never picked anything before oh awesome yeah so we uh met up at reserve 101 where you guys were shut down and um tasted through some whistle pick samples for a, a ride that'll be a few weeks a few months before it's here and also a Sagamore. We our Sagamore last mm -hmm. year was very successful. Yeah. And um, April texted me this morning about doing a podcast. I'm totally down. He, uh, their owner was on the show once before. Yeah. For Rye Day, which is November 13th for them. Okay. That's yeah, what they yeah. call it. That's their founding day, I believe. Um, so on this whistle pick, I just found out on the way in that it's 15 years old. Yep. So it's younger. I just said that, by the way. Oh, did you? Yeah. Oh. So it's uh, some of the other samples were up to 17. So this one was younger. But still pretty old for a whistle pick pick. I mean, fifteen year old single barrel pick for eighty bucks is one hundred percent a steal. Oh man, uh, it's the best. Absolutely, it's the best value in rye right now. I get a lot of cherry and like sweetness on this one. Um, the really there good. were some wild samples in there. Some so, some of it almost didn't taste like rye. Like very corny bu bubblegum note on this mm -hmm. too. Yeah, a lot of juicy fruit. Oh my god. <laughs> right up the nose. Wow. Wow. Uh, God, I love Whistle Pig. I used to give them a hard time I, uh, because of the price, but as, as the entire bourbon world has gone crazy pricing-wise, they're still pumping out double-digit age-stated single barrels at cast strength for yeah. crazy. And, and I know crazy. that it's not MGP anymore, but when it was, and it's you know 10 to 12 years old, MGP rye, like that's not cheap, you know? No. Yeah, and MGP has been growing in price as well. So, mm -hmm. so the Pappy, let, let's talk about this. We, we've given out a couple of clues in the comments or in the caption of previous episodes. Sure. Uh, we talked about this off air. I'm genuinely surprised at how both stupid some people are, how dangerous <laughs> they are uh, with this game, which makes me super nervous, <laughs> and how incredibly insightful they are. Uh, I will tell everyone who, the vast... Uh, the vast majority of people who've messaged me have figured out the Napoleon clue, yeah. which had to do not with Napoleon, but it had to do with the rail gauge. The old rail gauge used to be five foot six inches, which was what the height was of Napoleon. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was kind of a, a double entendre because it's been reduced to four foot eight inches and change. And often people think of Napoleon as being much shorter than five sure. foot six. I, I will say, I'm very proud of the level of intellect <laughs> that good. went into that clue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm going to brag on myself for a minute. But people figured it out. Lots of people figured it out. And so now everyone knows. 
Uh, and then obviously the very first clue was a nice little animated short that had to do with Whiskey Pete dressed like a train conductor. <laughs> if you haven't figured it out great. by now, the historical aspect of Houston that this game is centered around is our trains. The train, the, the railway history out of Houston. I thought about slipping in a joke with someone about, you know, there's that old, uh, w what's the abbreviation for tits and ass? TNA. TNA. Well, the guy who started and charted the very first railroad here in Houston was Ebenezer Allen, for those who put together the Christmas Carol reference. Yeah. And uh, it was TNO Railroad. And I thought about <laughs> slipping that in there in one of the conversations. But uh, yeah, so guys, it, we're, we've got a couple weeks left in the month. Three bottles have been found. The old Rip Van Winkle uh, was found at, uh, I believe, the Amtrak station. You guys on Reserve One One's Instagram page, mm -hmm. which by the way, follow the Reserve One One Instagram Please. page because they will, come be, as well. they will be releasing some exclusive clues there as well. And uh, the Blanton's bottle, mm -hmm. which was found in, on Produce Road, yep, one of the railway South Railway Railway yards. Try saying that five times <laughs> fast. And uh, what was the last one? Uh, the Weller Twelve, Weller 12. Was, was found next to the Metro Rail headquarters yeah. uh, on the east side. Mm -hmm. So we've got two bottles left, or three bottles left. That's the E.H. Taylor, mm -hmm. the Pappy Van Winkle 15, and the Old Rip Van Winkle Lot B. We still have two weeks left, three bottles left, and things are going well. Things are going really well. And I've heard from people, friends and family that I haven't heard from in a long time. <clears throat> it's fun to watch them navigate <laughs> navigate the, the reconnection and then ask about this, this contest they'd heard about. Uh, but yeah, we're excited to be, I mean, truthfully, it's, we're one of the few bars that, that during this, we haven't, we didn't alter and become a restaurant. We didn't go for the permits. We just decided that we were in a position that we were gonna Wait. be able to just, we were gonna be what we are. And and, and so we're waiting. Uh, uh, we're, we are definitely on the right path. Uh, Greg Abbott said 10% uh, positivity rate. He would- Governor he would, Hot Wheels. Yeah. That's right. Uh, and then uh, Sylvester Turner said five and we were at 4.1 as of yesterday, I believe. So we're, we're hoping that at any point in time we'll be able to open back up, which will be good for everybody. Uh, it, but, it but feels like it's close it, to me. It I, does, it does, finally, for the first time. Like, I, I see people, strangely enough, uh, I see people forgetting masks when they go into stores and they're not being told to, to put them on. And, and just very, everybody's just loosening up a little bit. And not to say that's, that's a good thing or a bad thing, just, just I see everybody kind of relaxing a little bit. And I'm sure that, that there's a lot of going on. And, and, but the bottom line is that I feel like we're finally on the doorstep of being able to do something. So this, the Pappy Hunt, has given us uh, an opportunity to just kind of get our hands wet again for yeah. a little while and, and, and be part of it. So yeah, we were, we were super excited when you called us. Yeah, so we, we plan to, once everything kind of normalizes and the bars open back up and all the bottles have been found, to, to host an event at Reserve 101 where we invite all the winners back and everyone who's played the game. Yeah. And we'll, we'll talk to the winners, we'll have a few drinks, we'll kind of celebrate the fun and, and getting sure. back to normal, normalcy. And yeah, I'm just, I'm just uh, glad to, to see the end, the end of the yeah. year look a lot better than the beginning and the middle. <laughs> yeah, I agree, <laughs> yeah. I agree. By the way, I don't know if it's the whistle pig right after the brandy, but it, it's really nice. It is. <laughs> it's it really is. good right after the, and I, again, it could be by, uh, by itself it's great, but Right after this, That's really we, good. we, we had some really good samples. Good. They they were all over the place, um, and in the end, it was almost unanimous on this one. So let's pull. Uh, let's let's taste the Sagamore. Yeah, this one was unanimous. I brought a dump glass, but I guess we didn't didn't need it. And so there were two there were two two tastings. One for the whiskey, one yeah. for the Sagamore. Yeah, we, we also did a plantation pick as well, and um, I'm still talking to Docs about that. Uh, I know we want it. It mm -hmm. was a good barrel. Yeah. Uh, no dosage. It's a blend of two Jamaican distilleries, and I think uh, the Jamaican last and Barbados. I oh, that's what it was. Jamaican and, and Barbados. It's a cognac finish. And a cognac finish. Right. Yeah. The, the first one we did, we did in ex Teeling Irish whiskey barrels, all Jamaican. It's very little funk. This one I haven't tasted, so I'm, I'm eager to. It's good to get it here. I liked it. The Jamaican comes through. I think the Barbados kind of balances it a little bit. Sure. God, I'm so excited! What a time, what a time, <laughs> what a time for spirits! All right, so let's let's uh, we'll jump into. I have not revisited this Balcony single barrel, but uh, we did an X Rumble pick for ESPN, and just so you know, these are available at Specs exclusively. Uh, if you go to the My Whiskey Neat page, you can uh, see which stores My Whiskey Neat on Facebook, 
as well as uh, Instagram. Which stores carry this within Houston? Ooh, Oops. excuse me. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. I love these. Oh, it smells like grapes. Oh man, like Dimatap grape. Like yeah, like yeah, sugar yeah. Grape. grape cough syrup. You love what? The gling, uh, these? The rumbles. Oh, the rumbles. No, this is not rumble. Oh, I'm sorry. What is this? It's single malt and X rumble. Oh. So they they this you know oh, the, these are the new ones. The, the new ones. Yeah, gotcha. the rumble cask reserve we love and we'll be picking out more. Single malt, a wide variety of the way they handle single malt at balconies between X rumble casks, X bourbon casks. It is very grapey. It's very grapey. The finish is almost like grape leaves, like a more vegetal. Yeah. Oh yeah, definitely more vegetal. Yeah. A little bit of brown sugar in there. I can spend all day, and I plan to in two weeks, <laughs> at that place, and just I can't wait. Go nuts. Just go nuts, <laughs> man. It's always God. fun. They they did. They're just so creative, like the different types of finishes and and things that they're mixing together and doing different size barrels and then combining them and just they just do a lot of different fun I, things. I talked to Nico Martini who wrote the Texas Cocktail Book is writing a new book on Texas whiskey and we had a long conversation the other day. I told him it's it's currently called I believe Texas Whiskey the book. I think it should be called Texas Whiskey the Era of Yes. I did an episode of my show with Iron Robert Licorice at Iron Root and Jared Hempstead over at Balconies a year ago. And we just talked about how this transformation in Texas whiskey in which they, they say yes to everything. Hey, we wanna bring you a, a Elijah Craig barrel that we aged honey in for a few months. Can you just yeah. put your whiskey in it and see what it tastes like? Yeah. Yeah, we'll try it. <laughs> Jake Clements from the Texas Whiskey Festival decided to, to, and surprisingly convinced four Texas distilleries to work together to release his own blend for his festival. I mean, we live in an era where for generations, Kentucky was saying no to everything. Yeah. We're too big. We're, we're not focused on these little projects. Texas has said yes to everything. We want to have a distilling camp at Iron Root. My rum barrels from Gregarious Grum. Where they go out of their way. They go out of their way. Out they of cook their for way us. to become, yeah. They cook for yeah. us. We had a bonfire in front of their facility. All night. All night. Yeah. And uh, we played music, you know, listening to the, I, I, is it Luis and his wife, is it pronounced Baston? Or Baston? I, I always thought it was Baston, but... Let's say Baston. Yeah. Forgive me if otherwise. Yeah, sorry, guys. <laughs> but uh, they sang acoustic... They sang Creep. Like, we just we just sat out there all night drinking. Je Jeremy <laughs> was playing just, guitar. Jeremy, Jeremy played play guitar, but, yeah. but Louis and his wife... Louise, mm -hmm. sorry, and his wife, they, they sang. And I've thought about their heavenly voices every day <laughs> yeah. since, since a year ago when we went. I mean, just this, this era of distilleries willing to go out of their way to try things just for the sake of how much fun this hobby is sure so anyways i uh i'll, I'll stop rambling about it but uh well let me ask you this so we got to the we've gotten to the point now where experimentation is kind of what people are doing finally but but texas for a while was kind of struggling to really put themselves on the map in, in terms of texas whiskey being a viable candidate outside of the state sure so as we move on to these new experimentation phases what do you think the what do you think the the anchors are for Texas whiskey? If somebody comes from another country, never been to America, and says, "Tell me about Texas whiskey." What do you think? What do you think the boxes that need to be checked for us as Texans? I mean, not necessarily just on paper, but like for us to feel like this is a Texas whiskey. Sight unseen, you take a sip of it and you think that's a Texas whiskey. What kind of characteristics do you guys think that Texas has to offer? Uh, okay, that's an interesting. Uh, I, I wouldn't focus on. The characteristics, because a lot of Texas distilleries are tr still trying to figure out what sure. what what works. Right. Uh, and and I and to be honest with you, this I forget what it's called, but what's it called when you're overtly patriotic, the self-aggrandizing obsession with your state or where you come from? I, I love Texas; it's beautiful. I'm not leaving, but I, I I I think that it doesn't bode well. Just like Americans, when we're obsessively freedom. Sure, like sure. That, what's that group that we make fun of all the time? The uh, uh, the Sinners Club, where it's like they're all, you know, that that America, like you know, <laughs> your truck has some truck nuts, and you're you're wearing your wife's wearing lingerie with the American flag sure, on sure, it, sure. and you're like guns and freedom, uh -huh. right? I hate that. Yeah. Yeah. Ultra patriots. Yeah. Ultra yeah. patriots. What well, Texas? I think uh, we don't bode well in other states when they have uh, what was that Devil's River? They they did a market research study showing their bottle that had several outlines of Texas on it and 
and the, a, a star. You know, we're big on adding like a like a deputy sure, Chuck sure. Norris star on sure. our. <laughs> I, this mentality is, uh, I think it's not the way we should be presenting our spirit. True. We should be focusing on the spirit and the terroir and the difference of of what to expect, but maybe not so much on the <clears throat> cowboy. But I wonder sure. if that's going to evolve because, you know, obviously we, we know how distilleries are when they first start. They have to put out products that will make the money to sell. And we know that, as you just said, Texas loves Texas. Yeah, but so, you can do that so, without that. Because it also turns people off no, you long could, term. No, well, I'm talking local because local Texas people walk into a big box store and they see Texas whiskey and it's very clear and they're like, I'm going to support this brand sure. because it's Texas. But yeah, that may not work n- nationwide. You can That's do- what I'm saying is I wonder if they don't evolve their branding once they get beyond you know, Texas because they, a lot of these brands sell great here, but, but maybe not in New York. They're going to look at that and be like, eh. Well, here's the thing. Too hokey. You can still do that without leaning heavy on the I'm a cowboy sort of thing. Well, the, sure. I think... I think Like uh, like Buck 8 is going too far with the the, hang, the ranch hand hang tech. Yeah, hang a little bit. I mean, no, <laughs> but, I, but Iron Root does it. They, <laughs> Iron Root does well in, in several states. I mean, Iron Root's killing it right now. They're one of the few Texas distilleries mm-hmm. that, it, that isn't hurting the way that other distilleries sure. are. Yeah, and, and they're and not overtly... zero overtly... Yeah. It's right. all in the POS. It's all in the, like, hey, this is made in Texas, grain to glass. Cool. But they're not leaning heavy. I mean, there's if you go to Specs, they sell tequila out of cowboy hats, out of some you know, right. out mm-hmm. of sombreros. There's even a glass sombrero, and it's right. like, what sure. are we doing? Yeah, what yeah. are we doing? So, <clears throat> that being said, um, what do we look for in in Texas? I would I would present the Rumble cask just to show them something off the wall. Mm-hmm. I would present a lot of our cast strength offerings. I had a great Garrison Brothers the other day at uh, the Rue Pour at Baybrook. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was their Balmorea. Mm-hmm. Again, I think Garrison's leans a little heavy on the, a little heavy on the country. Sure, sure, sure. But uh, it was fantastic and big bold cast strength. I get a little turned off with the barn hay, f- gasoline sure, intensity sure. sometimes. But I think yeah. a lot of distilleries have. I think that has to do with their what size barrels are you using. Yeah. You know, are you taking some cuts? A lot of Texas distilleries aren't taking cuts. Uh, but they're not trying to be Kentucky, and they shouldn't be. No, that's the thing. People can't go into Texas whiskey expecting Kentucky. And and to answer your question, I think single malts are fantastic in Texas. We've seen several different distilleries do them, and they're awesome. And I think that they stand up to, to scotch, and it's different. But I think it's something that I would present to someone. Um, also, I think up-and-coming rum. You know, with the the heat here, I think that there's potential there. I think we're just starting to see it. And then I love things like Rumble. Like, so I just had a friend uh, from Kentucky in town. He had never heard of it, and I gave him the Rumble tequila cask that we did, and he was blown away by it. And he those brought barrels it are insane. Yeah, and he brought it. He because he's like, well, what is it? I'm like, well, it's <laughs> I don't know. It's 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 uh, a, little, a spirit. Little column A, little column B. It's good. Yeah. yeah. Um, and he brought it, brought it home, one, right? and everyone in Kentucky that he brought it to loved it. So like stuff like that, and and that's what I like about the experimentation in Texas. I actually thought the tequila barrel was going to be more divisive than it was. It, it was. Almost I was surprised. Like I said, I I went into the three thinking it would be my least favorite, and it was my favorite. Yeah, yeah. And your wife, she actually posted on Instagram the sherry barrel. I think. Yeah, which so, is shocking. Uh, and you know what's funny? A good friend of mine, Charu. You know Charu Galand, over in California. He didn't care for the sherry as much because he felt like it was just overpowered with sherry. Yeah. And I didn't hate that. I mean, I, I didn't hate that. I the, like Sherry Bombs. Yeah, so I love Sherry Bombs. It was great. But I, mean, I could see how someone wouldn't like it, but but I like it a lot. Yeah, I wonder if I love Glendronic. Like <laughs> I do that? love Glendronic. Oh, of course. Who, who doesn't love Glendronic? I don't know of anyone who's like, you know what brand I hate? Yeah. But that's one of the, the easiest. Be- one, that's one of the best the single easiest, malts in the world. It's one of the easiest half steps to give somebody when they come in mm-hmm. and they say, well, I like McAllen, but I'd like to try something else. Something. Any big Sherry Glendronic is that. It's the first step into a new world of mm-hmm. big sherry scotches. I feel like people feel safe on an island with things like Macallan and and even Dalmore to a degree is, is an exquisite whiskey, but it's it's around now and it's present. It's it's popular, and so I think that uh, Glendronic is is starting to kind of get that accolade as well. It was my entry point because I I started in Scotch and then I realized I didn't like it. I, I kind of fell out of it, and then I someone then you brought got back a, into it. someone brought a Glenjo eighteen, and I was like, okay, this is good. Yeah. So I just but I, we're, that's kind of like my wheelhouse now. I like sherry Scotch. I yeah. haven't gone into the heavy PD stuff. I think I probably will because I'm it's it's been a good entry point. Yeah, Pete, Pete is a Pete is a tough one. Watching people, it, it, I, I always kind of. 
I always kind of liken it to, to kind of the cigar of the whiskey world. Like it's one of those, it's just one of those things that, that very rarely, I, I, I have very rarely witnessed, not to say it doesn't happen because people jump out of the woodwork when I say this, but I've rarely witnessed somebody come in new to whiskey, try a PD whiskey and love it. And it's usually, sure. it's usually just the abrasive nature of how strong it is. It's not so much. It's overwhelming. Yeah. It's funny. I, I probably told this story before, but um, I, I think my first scotch uh, that I remember at least was when I first moved here to Texas and I went into Specs and I'm standing in the scotch aisle and I had no idea what I was doing. And I don't know why I didn't, I wasn't just honest with them because he's like, what are you looking for? I'm like, I don't know. I'm looking for something in like the $70 range. Um, and he put me into a 10 year super PD. Well, he asked me if I like Pete and I'm like, yeah, sure. He seems cool. Uh, I, I, I don't know what, what, what Pete is. Um, so he put me into Goose Island 10, um, which just when you open it, it smells like an ashtray. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I used to get in trouble for opening it at all in the house. And it was, you know, at first, uh, I think like most whiskey drinkers, I was like, okay, it's not bad. But, and then I realized later it's not good. Yeah. Yeah. It's just yeah. not. <laughs> Yeah, I think you will get into it too because the one thing I've said about you, Todd, uh, Todrick, is I think that you are huge into uh, expanding your palate and learning. And uh, I recently have ranted to you guys about the the nature of this hobby in which a lot of people who only ever drink bourbon shit on everything else and have yeah. all these opinions about all these things, but they have very narrow, underdeveloped palates. True. And it's part of my frustration because where I'm not saying I have this great palate. In fact, I've gone out of my way to not be, not to present myself that way because of where I, where I am sure. in this hobby. Sure. If if I present myself as this badass and people taste things that they don't care for, it it's just going to be like oh, Chris doesn't know what he's talking about. Sure. I've I've tried to avoid all of that. Todd, however, we did a blind tasting recently. Blew it out of the park. He he did everything he could to really pick apart every sample. You ended up winning that blind mm -hmm. challenge, and you you objectively have a great palate. What was the challenge like? What you had to so we Wade, had, uh, Wade basically had a bunch of samples, eight, 18 blind samples. They were and, picks, and, the, the best of of the Gulf region picks is what oh, it was. Wow. And everyone's supposed to taste it, give their review, give their rating, maybe guess what it was, and you guessed several of them correct. Yeah, I got half of them. Well, wow. yeah, I, I guess the distillery and the product. Yep. And yeah. he dethroned the current champ, another one of the admins, Randy that's, Svetlick. That's the, that's the big part of it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, Randy talks a lot of shit because Randy's known around town as having a good palate. Oh, he has a great palate. And he's yeah. been He's been part of a great pick group for a long time. So, but see that that uh, motivation was, was you had to dethrone him is exactly why I try not to. <laughs> I just say like if I like something, I like something. Sure, sure. But it does drive me nuts because even though I don't present myself that way, mm -hmm. uh, I pick a lot of things that are outside the box. Sure. And people love to. Nope, not a fan of this. So I just yeah, yeah. just last night, like just to show that it's it's fun to branch out even if it's not your favorite spirit. So I don't like to smoke your peaty. Mezcal is something that in the past I was just kind of not going to seek it out. If someone said I have a great one, I'm I'm always willing to try something. So I got some samples and I I sat through and I I've said before to a lot of people when you're getting started, pull the flavor wheel out. I was trying to write notes and I I wanted a, a mezcal flavor wheel because it's just different. It's very earthy and grassy different ball, and like yeah. all kinds of different things. I had a great time drinking it and going through the wheel and like what am i tasting here sure. because i'm not used to that and it and, and it made me enjoy the whole experience more just you know just spending time with it even if it's not something that i don't seek out i loved it and it, it was it was a lot of fun i feel like something i feel like i feel like people get intimidated by people with exceptional palates if you will uh, for lack of a better term people people that are new to whiskey sit down you tell them you tell them you taste things like tobacco and dried mint and Bubblegum, juicy fruit, things of that nature, and, and they immediately think, "Well, I don't taste anything close to that. This seems like maybe this isn't my thing." And it's amazing. It's amazing to watch people as their progression, as they as they continue to taste new whiskeys and, and adapt, and all of a sudden they're the ones that are coming up with with even more nuances. It's, and I think a lot of times cool the power progression. the power of suggestion is there sure. too. Like if you're giving simpler notes, a lot mm -hmm. of people will go, like Chris said, bubblegum, and then it's like, yeah, I, I get bubblegum. Yeah, sure. You know, I, and, and that's why I say again, the flavor wheel is something I always um, recommend for somebody that's just getting started because I'm not sophisticated with my descriptions. Sure. If, if you just told me blind, you know, describe this, 
it's not going to be very very eloquent sure. but if you give me 15 minutes with my phone and like I can sit down with it then yes I'm going to give you great yeah. tasting notes get a uh, thesaurus and say marzipan <laughs> there's, but there's nothing wrong with that because you know my brain just doesn't make the connection directly I, I need a little help to, to tell me what it is that I'm tasting this. rhubarb <laughs> anything with more than two <laughs> syllables and you well, sound so, like a, that's right. <laughs> so, so I felt like I had to step up my game with balconies because when you look at Jared's notes it's it's things like you know uh, like brown autumn leaves yeah and Dude. like shoe polish and Balconies I'm like, Bro, is this really is good about like their uh, <laughs> their notes their they, notes are crazy yeah he finds a way to find like some off the wall item that I'm I, I taste it I'm like wow it does taste like shoe this, polish just uh, a like a like a South African uh, uh, brown sugar <laughs> at like 20% yeah. burnt you know just <laughs> in March <laughs> yeah crazy 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 yeah. <laughs> but um God, this is... I'm so really is this another... This. I see it says French Yeah, so oak. this is a much heavier... What what they did is it was French oak that previously held rumble. Well, look at the difference in the color. I know. Yeah. Just, yeah. And obviously, I think one was first fill rumble. The second one was a little bit more mild. Uh, but they're night and day different. Both X rumble. A lot that more darker. Like black. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this one's like night. Yeah, Reserve did a, uh, did a private barrel years ago for our 10th anniversary. Four years ago, I guess it would be. Uh, and we did a the single malt Asian European oak. Uh... Which was great. It was it was super high proof, and it was a uh, Asian European oak. Yeah, it's that, I mean that that yeah, it was their single malt Asian European oak. Interesting. Yeah. So I wonder if it's the same species, but maybe grown in Asia. We still have a couple. Of, we still have a couple of uh, bottles, bottles at the bar. Yeah, I'll bring you one. <clears throat> um, oh, that re that reminds me. I mean, at this point, they might as well just be mailing these things to me. I mean, we had such. You've, you've been up how many times with me for the little? For where? For the to balconies privately. Uh, with you twice, I think, or maybe three. Besides times. the big summit we did in February. Twice, yeah, and I went up one time without you when we when we did our initial selections for the summit. Okay, yeah, that's what it was. Yeah, so I'm really looking forward to it. Me too. Um, I, I also love brought a 1984 JW Dant bottled in bond. Uh, I've been needing a reason to open that, and we have about cool. 15 minutes left before Todd's got to go. That's the reason. Uh, that's that's all the reason I need, man. It's all the reason I need. Okay, I will dump that. All right, yeah, I'll dump this one too. Let's see here. You didn't get to try the Sagamore. You get to try that too. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll do the Sagamore next. I'm gonna set this down real quick. So you said the second pick took a little bit longer than the first pick. Mainly uh, because we just wanted to hang out afterwards. Yeah, okay. <laughs> we just have it. It, it was actually out. less samples, um, but we. I, I like to take a break in the middle of a pick, so mm -hmm. we we were drinking and we were kind of stuck. It was a split room, sure. so so we walked out of the room and then I I like to and then blind the two. Sure. And then when you come back ten or fifteen minutes later, your palate resets, and and I think people get confused about what's what. Sure. But it was it then became unanimous. Everybody liked the same one. I yeah. think we got got a good one. Yeah. Yeah, I'm excited to try it. Be careful sliding that bottle More. across the table with the mics, but uh, I poured. It Jake's. literally has dust on it. <laughs> yeah, an actual dusty, hence the word. Sure enough. That's like cake on dust. Yeah, 1984. Uh, that bottle smells insane. Obviously, pre fire Heaven Hill. Actually, I don't even know. That is not. It tastes very odd. <laughs> it smells actually, musty. I, I try not to <laughs> misspeak here. I don't remember. Yeah, DSP number two. Number two. Oh, it's two. Indiana. That's awesome. No, hold on. This is very odd. Bottled at DSP Indiana two. Distilled at DSP KY 113, Frankfort, Kentucky. Wow. Anyways, um, interesting. So muted. Yeah, it is. That's an odd one. I mean, for hundred proof for a bonded whiskey, that's pretty neat. It's, well, it definitely proof, dropped. The proof is definitely dropped. Yeah, yeah. Speaking of which, I wanted to also mention that uh, I I plan to release a quick two minute, three minute video. I got on the horn with the people over at Bullet and the people over at Four Roses, <laughs> and uh, instead of having the debates in the comments, I'm excited already. Instead of having the debates in the comments, uh, I, w I figured I could put out a, two, a quickly digestible two to three minute video and just say, hey, these are the questions I asked. These are the questions. That That's what you do. I mm -hmm. work in media. I'm a, I'm, I guess I'm technically a uh, news reporter. 
whatever the wow. frick you, whatever you want to call Look it, you. right? All technically. Right. So technically, tech barely technically. <laughs> I mean, that line is blurry as hell. Mm. Uh, but the question often comes up. I went to Bullet. I picked out a barrel from the barrel program. Is my bullet four roses? Now, Betteridge's law will tell you that any headline that asks a, qu- ask a question, the answer is always no. Sure. So I'll preemptively tell you the answer is no. Uh, but there is this prevailing theory that four roses was distilling for Bullet for many years. Mm-hmm. And that stopped in 2015. Bullet has just released a bunch of 10 plus year old, eight to 10 plus year old single barrels for their barrel program. You go there, it's 10 different recipes, two different mash bills, five different yeasts. Five different yeasts. <laughs> Sound familiar? Mm-hmm. So one percent difference in the mash bill on the ride. That's it. Yeah. So, so it's very similar. It makes sense, but that's actually quite common. Mash bills. But the yeast being different is a huge difference. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's not the same yeast. It's not the same. Yeah. So as the catalyst, yeah. there's yeah. this prevailing thought that uh, those barrel picks are basically four roses picks sure. at 104 proof. Here's the problem with that. Why would you think that? Now, there's parts of this I don't know. So I plan to approach this objectively. But there's parts of this I don't know. As far as I think, this is what I'm not sure about, and there's things I am very sure about. As far as I know, that the the uh, Four Roses only ever distilled one recipe for them. That it wasn't all 10 recipes. They didn't have access to all that. Two, what I do know for a fact, now it might have been more than one recipe. That's what I'm waiting to find out. But what I do know for a fact is that all the liquid that leaves Four Roses today, uh, it, Basically, they stopped contract distilling in 2015. Mm -hmm. As those barrels come to age, they're dumped and sent in a tanker to Bullet. They don't leave in single barrels. Well, Chris, it might be rebarreled at Bullet and then sold as a single barrel. That's very expensive. Yeah. And they've patently, patently, blatantly denied it. They said, no, we don't rebarrel these. So I've had this whole conversation. It seems extremely costly and time consuming. So what people are basically saying, what they don't realize what they're saying, is that Four Roses only ever distilled one thing for them, and Four Roses already has a hard time keeping up with their 600-barrel program. But, but I guess the question is, if, if they stopped in what year? 2015? 15. So they could have created stuff that's 10 years old now that's go, as, at Bullet. Yeah. Did, did they ever send single barrels so, out? Did they so, ever send single barrels out? It, and I asked that question. I also like asked five years ago. I also asked what price, what year age range is the stock when it leaves? Because mm-hmm. you, the the December 2018 trip that you, me, Adrian, and Mike went, they were dumping Diageo barrels. Then we saw them. We took pictures in front of the empty barrels. You remember mm-hmm. those photos of us standing in front of all those empty barrels at Four Roses are all Diageo bullet barrels. Mm-hmm. They dumped those barrels, sent it over in a tanker. So I asked him, how old is the stock when it leaves? If it's six to eight years old, that means that these eight to 10 year old barrels are not. Are not. Are not. Unless you're saying, and, and I was saying this before Todd said something, they've, if they've only ever made one recipe and they had to stop, Four Roses cut them off. And Four Roses is already having a hard time keeping up with current demand. You're saying that somehow Four Roses has enough juice to supply yeah. two full programs and let bullet recoup all of that like benefit from it financially and all that if if four roses has that income and by the way they're selling it for much more money yeah i suspect that bullet it doesn't make any bullet sense has some barrels that were distilled at four roses and sent out in a in a barrel I, i'm this is just based on nothing that is a great question other than the fact that i've tasted a couple that it, and i've drank a lot of four roses that it's it tastes very similar to four roses product so but i've had others that absolutely are not absolutely are not when i approached four roses on this i talked to mandy who's the head of their barrel program we started an email chain with Brent elliott and their pr companies so we will get a formal statement from the people who would know yeah at bullet or at, at Bullet and at Four Roses. I also talk to Bullet's people. But I want to get a collaborative statement from both sides that address all of those questions. Sure. I know it doesn't leave the distillery now in a barrel. Has it ever left in a barrel? Have you ever sent barrels over there? Because then it could be. If um, Does it leave in a tanker currently? Have you guys ever sold Bullet more than one mash bill? If so, how many of them? Um, 
I'm asking Bullet, do you guys are you guys rebarreling into brand new barrels with the juice that comes over? Uh, they said no, but I'm going to get a formal. Would, would would they answer you if you asked them if they're bound or have ever been bound by a non disclosure? Oh, uh, so w- yes, I asked them as well. And that would the non disclosure force them to say no? Yeah, well, you know, that's not how non disclosures work. One of the questions that does come up is, are, well, distilleries have been not truthful before. Yeah, they could lie, but why? They've never had a reason to lie before. They they were never hiding their relationship with Four Roses. They've openly addressed, like, yeah, the worst kept secret in bourbon is everyone knows that Bullet was sourcing from Four Roses. If they've never had a reason to lie about their relationship, but somehow now they have enough juice to give them all 10 recipes and for them to sell it cheaper than Four Roses. Yeah. So you're telling me that a, a company is willing to supply at a $25 price difference, a cheaper... Yeah. But it doesn't make any it, sense. Four Roses the can detail, sell it themselves. The detail that I think some people lose, though, is that just because Four Roses distilled it doesn't mean you need to act like it's Four Roses juice because it's a different mash bill and it's different yeast, right? Yeah. I mean, the mash bill is similar, but it's different yeast. Yeah. It's not the same stuff. I do know that they were getting OBSV, or is it, I always forget what, what recipe, but I did see the DG OBSV. Yeah, I've seen that. Yeah, yeah. So I, I know I know for sure at least one recipe was going to yeah. Four Roses. And one of the questions that came up, there's a guy named Charles Cumberland in HBS, and he's gotten riled up about this subject before and when asked a question just kind of fell silent uh he seems like a nice guy i'm definitely not trashing him but one of the things he said is that exclusively 10 years ago bullet was sourcing exclusively from four roses Mm -hmm. i don't necessarily believe that that's true and so i asked them can you guys confirm if you ever exclusively sourced from four roses just to like cover all of our bases, all the questions that have come mm-hmm. up over this debate yeah. over whether or not Bullet is sourcing from Four Roses for their barrel program, which doesn't add up logically. Simplistically, it makes sense. Oh, 10 recipes, 10 recipes, boom, 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 boom. But Four Roses would have to be, who's already having trouble keeping up with their demand, willing to sell and give access to a whole other brand at a much right. bulker, a bulk price rate. Right. When they could sell it themselves direct sure. at cash strength for $25 more. Yeah. Maybe that was the parameters of the original agreement. But in 2015, you know, it wasn't the same as it was as it is the last few years. So I, this makes me wonder about the past. In the past, sure. Certainly now, no. Sure. It's hard enough to get a barrel pick now. That was a great question. And there's some debate over why their relationship ended. Could Four Roses not keep up and now they want to focus on themselves? Mm-hmm. Or, and this has come up as well, there was some conversations that happened about in the past where Jim Rutledge had some suspicion that what was in the bullet bottle wasn't just Four Roses, and it was supposed to be just Four Roses. Mm -hmm. Some testing was done. I've heard it both ways. Some testing was done, and they found out they bought a bottle of bullet off the shelf. Some testing was done, and it was not just Four Roses. It was a blend of something else. Sure. Sure. I've heard that that was upsetting, and that was part of the reason why they separated. So that this is all assuming that there was an exclusive. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I've also heard the opposite, that they tested it, and it was not supposed to be just Four Roses, and that it was tested, and it was all Four Roses, and that also upset Four Roses. Okay. That makes did. more sense to me. Yeah, yeah. Me too. So I mean, it, but it, at that point, it's rhetoric, and I want to be very clear. Yeah. There's things I know for sure, and things I am not quite sure of, so I don't want to be, I don't want to die on the cross, so to speak, for yeah. this thing. Um. Mm-hmm. We will find out. So that video will be out soon. We'll address it. In a, and I'm just going to approach it with like, hey, I looked into this to be sure. I don't want it to come off as preach you're arrogant. Sure. But if we can get the, the question answered, you know. It'll, yeah. Hopefully yeah. it'll. Hopefully it'll, it can be definitive in some way because you know how people like to poke holes. I'm and they hoping. Will. <laughs> I'm hoping. <laughs> hoping to be definitive. How much time we got left? About five minutes? You got to leave it exactly? Yeah. Yeah. So we got two minutes. Good man. All right. Well, listen. I'm just enjoying this. Um, what else? Uh, there was something I was going to mention before. We, we didn't taste the Sagamore. So let's do that. Do you have time for Sagamore? Just pour me the Sagamore. You can yep. leave. <laughs> you can get the... F- <laughs> that's uh, the Wispy. Wrong one. You have it already. I already poured my Sagamore. Oh, so that's my Sagamore. Okay. So this is a seven-year. Seven-year? Wow. Schmancy. I think their standard is normally oh, yeah. around six, so it's a little yeah, bit older. yeah. yeah. 
It's a blend of two six-year-old barrels, I believe. I forget. Yeah, it's a high and low rye MGP. Oh, oh yeah. That smells insane. Oh, tons of... I, so from Sagamore specifically, I get a ton of that, that sherry influence, those, those Christmas flavors, red berries, baked fruit. It's actually, it's pretty good. That's really good. Yeah, I'd, uh, I definitely would totally mail this to someone in the mail. And this one's 110 because you know they do the standard 110, and mm-hmm. the, the whistle pig we had was is one of 3.5. You know, it's being funny, a little older, the proof really drops down. One of the best whistle pigs I've ever had was 120. The, I think it was Brian Wayne at Poison Grove that did it. Mm. And then uh, I've had a lot of really good lower proof ones that were cast strength that just yeah. incredible. So, listen, I appreciate you guys coming out. It's been fun. Enjoy drinking with you. Thanks for coming on the new set. It's beautiful. I like and, it like uh, this, dude. Jace, ready to have a party? I am so excited about this. Man, let's get this game going. Yeah, man. yeah, it's gonna be good. I'm excited yeah. to start changing in these coins as well. Oh yeah, yeah. I don't know if you guys seen, but those coins are awesome. Oh yeah, mm-hmm. dude, they're awesome, bring man. One. I brought it. Yeah, I brought I'm it. So I brought glad. it. I'm so glad. These uh, I'm gonna we're gonna get more of these made. Yeah, these are insane, and we plan on making this bigger and yeah. better. Yeah, every single year. So, oh, man. listen, Todd. Thanks so much for coming, guys. I'd give you a, a fist bump, but we'll stay socially distanced. And uh, cheers. 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 Bing. Balcony's first ever year-round bourbon was an inspiration. It all had to work together. A blend of carefully selected ingredients, Texas-sized pot stills, and creative people determined to find the absolute best way to usher a new whiskey along. When you discover how it pairs with a meaningful moment, suddenly the feeling of drinking great whiskey becomes a whole lot more.